Thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying his country will do all that is needed to defend itself. The statement coming as Israel makes its plans for striking back against Iran for its attack over the weekend. And Iran threatening the complete annihilation of the Zionist regime if Israel invades its territory. Here at home, Texas Governor Greg Abbott telling CBN News he will not back down in his legal battle with the Biden administration. As the Lone Star State cuts down the flow of illegal immigration across the border. And an 11-year-old girl's request for a prayer club denied, even through her high school, even though her high school allowed an LGBTQ plus club. All those stories and more today, right here on CBN News Watch. This is CBN News Watch. Let's begin this half hour in Israel, where the government is moving ahead with its plans to retaliate against Iran for its massive missile and drone attack over the weekend even though plans for that Israeli response have been changing. Still, Israel's leadership is making it clear it will do whatever is needed to defend themselves. CBN's Julie Stahl brings us the story. She reports from Jerusalem. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says world leaders want the Jewish state to go easy in striking back at Iran after it attacked with more than 300 drones and missiles. But I want to make clear that we will make our own decisions and the state of Israel will do all that is needed to defend itself. Wednesday, Iran's president warned Israel will face a massive and harsh response for any invasion of its territory, threatening, quote, the complete annihilation of the Zionist regime. Israel says it will be ready. We are preparing ourselves for the next time, debriefing the mission and seeing how could we prepare ourselves for the, for the next attack, uh, if it would uh, come. After Israel's air defense forces destroyed 99 percent of incoming drones and missiles, Rabbi Yitzhak Adlerstein tells CBN News there's only one way to explain its tremendous success. We were all witness to nothing short of a miracle of biblical proportions. I think it's going to take a little while for the, the full effect of it, for the facts to set in. Israel is now facing another threat on the diplomatic front. Friday, the U.N. Security Council will hold a vote on a Palestinian request for full membership. That move, which could lead to recognition of a Palestinian state, is expected to be blocked by the U.S. Meanwhile, families of the Israeli hostages in Gaza got a boost when Time magazine named American Israeli Rachel Goldberg Poling as one of the top 100 most influential people in the world. Her 23-year-old son Hirsch was kidnapped and remains in Gaza. She told CBN News, hope in God is very important. My faith gives me tremendous hope. I don't know how I could do this without knowing that someone is in charge mm -hmm. of this whole complicated, painful, difficult situation. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Our CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell joins us now with more from Jerusalem. So Chris Netanyahu says Israel will do what's necessary to defend itself, but there are reports Israel held off on an immediate response to Iran after Netanyahu spoke with President Biden. What do you know about that and how Israel plans to strike Iran? Well, Ephraim, there's really a lot of reports out there right now. Since Israel hasn't uh, responded right away or within a, a day or two after the attack uh, last Saturday night and Sunday morning, and uh, one of them is saying that the military actions by Israel had been planned, but quote unquote diplomatic sensitivities won out. That could be referring to the phone call with President Biden, uh, but some form of action against I Iran. I believe it, it's really a, just a matter of question of uh, when, not of if. Uh, another report says that Israeli uh, attack may take place after the Passover holiday, which would give Israelis an opportunity to perhaps take a deep breath, relax, enjoy the holiday. It's a major family holiday over here and a religious one as well, celebrating the deliverance of the Israelites 
from their slavery in Egypt. And many Jews this year are seeing a connection between the threat of Egypt to the Jewish people more than 3,000 years ago and the threat of Iran today. Uh, and so they see a great significance by celebrating this, uh, this celebration. And then it also starts uh, next Monday evening and goes a week through April 30th. Chris, there is a report out of the Middle East that the U.S. will agree to an Israeli assault on the last Hamas stronghold in Rafah in return for not carrying out a large strike against Iran. What can you tell us about what we're hearing there? Well, that's one of the reports out there, Ephraim. It really shows you how far we've come in just a few days. Uh, you know, a few days ago, uh, uh, Gaza and the operation, potential operation in Rafa was dominating the headlines. Now, the showdown with Iran is dominating the Middle East. So one possible scenario is that Israel is agreeing to a smaller response to Iran, then dealing with Rafa and, and with the permission or the green light of the United States and uh, dealing with Hamas. Uh, remember, there's four battalions there by Hamas, uh, the leaders of Hamas, and as well as likely all the hostages that are remaining, and then dealing with Hezbollah in the north, then dealing with Iran. But, uh, but you know, we don't know exactly, uh, Ephraim, how Iran's going to respond, and may they interfere with those plans. Uh, one special ops uh, friend of mine once told me, you know, the enemy gets a vote, too. So we'll have to watch and uh, wait to see how things unfold. But also, as believers, we can watch and pray into the developments here in the region. Indeed. How are Israelis reacting to what happened over the weekend? Well, Ephraim, it's really... It, it's kind of funny in a sense. Uh, somebody last night sent me a little meme on... A, there was a circle on one of the circles. It was called the apocalypse, and that was pretty much what was going on Saturday night. With the drones coming, everyone thought... What is this going to be mean to, to Israel? On the other side was a circle, and it said, going to work. So people had to wonder, we're looking at apocalypse Saturday night. Sunday morning, the question was, do I go to work? And uh, it's exactly how what many experience. I talked to a businessman this morning. It's actually what he was saying. So you go from a sense of doom to death and destruction. All of a sudden, the threat is over. Do I go to work? Really such a credible change. Uh, and as Rabbi Adlerstein say uh, in our re Julie's report, many people are explaining it as a miracle. At the moment, we're not hearing much about the war against Hamas after Iran's attack. Is Israel still making progress against Hamas in Gaza? Well, we don't, we don't know in the last few days, Ephraim, the IDF carried out a number of airstrikes across the Gaza Strip and then also hitting dozens of terror targets, and they killed a senior Hamas official. Uh, the IDF also said uh, today that the ground forces, they c completed a raid on a Bet Hanun area. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, what people are saying here in Israel, these strikes came out as footage has come out of thousands of Gazans being on the beach, enjoying a day at the beach. And uh, why that sparks criticism here in Israel is that the government's not doing enough because in, in Gaza right now, there's 133 hostages uh, still languishing in Hamas captivity. Israel is also constantly dealing with a threat from Hezbollah to the north. What is the latest on that front? Well, we know yesterday a Hezbollah drone strike wounded 14 soldiers and four civilians in a northern Israeli town. Hezbollah said it was revenge for an Israeli strike that killed three of its uh, commanders or two of its commanders. Uh, now, there's been almost daily attacks in, uh, in the north since uh, October 8th. During that time, Hezbollah has killed 10 Israeli soldiers, eight civilians. On the other side, Hezbollah has killed maybe about almost 280 members of the Hezbollah. Uh, so it's a it's an ongoing uh, debate. I mean, low scale war going up, but we'll see how things unfold uh, in the days to come. All right, always watching and waiting, Chris Mitchell. Thank you so much for reporting from Jerusalem. We appreciate your insights, and we continue to pray for you and our entire team there in Israel. Coming up here at home, the battle over the border is now also a legal battle, as Texas Governor Greg Abbott tells CBN News the number of migrants coming into his state has dropped dramatically because of the actions Texas is taking. Now he is involved in a court battle with the Biden administration over a new state law to fight illegal immigration. We're going to hear from him when we come back.
Get your daily quick start from CBN News. A quick read on the important news of the day delivered right to your inbox. Stay current on breaking news, politics, and entertainment. Go to quickstart.news and subscribe today. Texas Governor Greg Abbott tells CBN News he will not back down in his legal battle against the Biden administration over his state's attempt to secure the southern border. The fight centers around a new measure allowing state law enforcement agencies to arrest illegal immigrants. CBN chief political analyst David Brody brings us this exclusive interview from Austin, Texas. The saying goes, everything is bigger in Texas. Well, that includes the fight over illegal immigration. Enter Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Thanks for inviting us inside the Texas Governor. Pleasure to have you here. He has a Texas-sized battle on his hands, not just at the border, but in Washington, D.C. Joe Biden has a requirement under the Constitution yeah. uh, to uh, secure our national security. Uh, he's utterly failed at that. And so Abbott has taken matters into his own hands. He's building a wall and a handful of border counties. The state has its own border czar. He's bust illegal immigrants out of Texas and into liberal sanctuary cities. And his Operation Lone Star program has led to a half a million illegal immigrant apprehensions and the seizure of almost 500 million lethal doses of fentanyl. Illegal immigration has gone down in the state of Texas by 72%. Mm -hmm. At that very same time, it has increased in California, Arizona, and New Mexico by 24 mm percent. -hmm. So it shows that what we are doing is working. But the Biden administration says Texas has overstepped their authority, especially when Abbott installed razor wire in Eagle Pass or floating barriers in the Rio Grande. At the center of the illegal immigration fight here in Texas is a law backed by Governor Abbott giving state law enforcement agencies the power to arrest illegal immigrants. The Biden administration is fighting it, and most likely this will end up at the U.S. Supreme Court. While that works its way through the legal system, the tension mounts between the state of Texas and the feds. I know this term of civil war, but in other words, skirmishes between the Texas uh, law enforcement and the federal uh, government. Are you concerned about that at the border if Biden gets another term? Let's say I'm resolute about what Texas is, d is doing. How far will Texas go here? Because you can go, you can go pretty far. Well, our goal is to make sure that we defend our border uh, to the point uh, where we are able to completely reduce illegal crossings into the state of Texas. But does that mean going into Mexico? Certain Republicans, like former President Trump and Ron DeSantis, have floated the idea of carrying out attacks on drug cartels inside Mexico. In the case of Governor Abbott, he officially called this an invasion. So according to Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3 of the Constitution, that means a state can engage in war if an invasion happens. Have you thought about, is it off the table, that you would go and get rid of these drug cartels, certain ones within Mexico, actually going into Mexico? So I've already declared uh, the, the drug cartels as terrorist organizations, mm -hmm. uh, and that authorizes law enforcement to take uh, extra action against it. Uh, and you can, you can have a war without actually invading a country. The, the, the war uh, would not be against Mexico. The war at this moment is here on the homeland, and one of Abbott's biggest and gravest concerns is those from the Middle East coming over that are on the terror watch list. Some of them are known, many are not. And just as much of a concern to Abbott are Chinese men of military age illegally entering the country. Last year, there were more than 24,000. In the first uh, part of this fiscal year, there's already another 22,000. Right. And, and so uh, th there's basically uh, a Chinese military uh, equivalent uh, in the United States of America. And once again, no one knows what these people are up to. Of course, those aren't the only ones coming over. There are families who are seeking asylum and a better life here in America and are desperate to get away from horrible conditions. Some people will say, well, you need to have compassion. Others will say, well, wait, law and order, making sure there isn't chaos, is compassionate. Well, it, it, chaos obviously is not compassionate. Right. But also what is not compassionate uh, is the federal government of the United States enticing women, children, and others uh, to be uh, sexually assaulted by the drug cartels, mm -hmm. physically abused, sometimes murdered by them, or, or enticing them into a situation where uh, they drown trying to cross the river. There's nothing compassionate mm -hmm. about a deadly border. There is something compassionate, however, about order in society. Mm -hmm. And what Texas is trying to achieve 
is order in our society. In the meantime, Abbott's battle against the federal government rages on. David Brody, CBN News, in Austin, Texas. Still ahead, an 11-year-old girl's request for a prayer group at her elementary school denied, even though it had allowed an LGBTQ plus club. We're going to bring you a look at what happened. Got the story for you coming up right after this. An 11-year-old girl in Washington state who was forbidden from starting a prayer club at her school says she only wanted to get together with like-minded students to support their community through the club. Although Creekside Elementary School officials allowed an LGBTQ plus club on campus, they rejected the proposed prayer group. Appearing on this week's episode of the Global Lane, Campus Reform Education Fellow, Ken Tashi explains the club the girl suggested would have been an interfaith group. It wasn't a, a prayer group that was isolated or limited to one religion. This student's interest was to bring together uh, students of, of varied backgrounds and varied faiths to discuss their faith, share their faiths, and to pray together. And um, I would suggest that that probably is the, the strongest form of diversity and inclusion that you'd want to see in our schools, particularly our public schools. But unfortunately, I believe it's, it's just not the right diversity and inclusion. Well, it seems like it's inclusion for everyone ex except for Christians or people who want to pray. The school says, well, they don't have the budget. Laura said if money's the issue, she'll raise the funds to support the club. So don't school officials believe in religious liberty, the First Amendment? I'm sure this girl wouldn't want to force anyone to join the club, neither would the school district. So what's the issue here? Yeah, it, I ultimately don't think it has anything to do with money. This has to do with the school's decision to support secular groups, um, like a, a pride group for students, like a climate change group for students at this school, but then to directly deny uh, the same rights that this religious or this faith-based group is owed under the First Amendment. Uh, this group has rights of free speech. It has rights of uh, freedom of religion and freedom of association. And the school's efforts here directly violate those rights. Well, how about higher institutions of learning, Ken? We're still seeing plenty of discrimination, violations of constitutionally protected freedoms on college and university campuses. Any recent in incidents that uh, concern you right now? What and where? Well, there's a whole host of incidents uh, and a, a couple of things. For example, um, you've got uh, the, the largest, one of the largest fines issued against a higher educational institution at Grand Canyon University. Um, that is the largest Christian university in the country. Uh, it was just fined almost $40 million for allegedly lying uh, about its doctoral programs, uh, when at the same time, uh, many other institutions that have similar uh, findings against them, or even in some cases, much more egregious uh, uh, circumstances, have been fined much less. Uh, for example, at Michigan State University, there was a finding over a series of years that has systematically failed to address sexual harassment and sexual assaults on their campus. And they were only fined approximately $4 million. Um, so that's a real concern, whether there is a targeting out there, whether it be at the elementary, secondary ed level, or at the higher ed level. And I might also add that currently the Biden administration's Department of Education is looking to withdraw federal regulations that protect faith-based groups in higher education. And the rationale is that they say that enforcing those regulations against college and universities that are denying faith-based groups their rights is unduly burdensome on the Department of Education, which sounds a little bit backwards, I would say. And state legislators are pushing back, though, in Missouri, House Bill 1518 would stop discrimination on state colleges and universities. So tell us about that. Why is the human rights campaign uh, condemning that legislation? Well, the, the legislation in Missouri is very similar to 17 other states that have passed at this point legislation protecting faith based groups. Um, and, it, and it runs in line with the existing federal regulations that were established in 2020, which, which again, protect faith-based groups. Um, but what, uh, what some groups argue or allege is that its intent is actually to discriminate against um, LGBT students who may not espouse 
the faith-based uh, beliefs that the groups, that these faith-based or religious groups would like to start. Um, you know, and, and the, one thing is clear, that uh, no one has a right to demand or force you to associate with someone who you don't want to associate with. So uh, many of these faith-based organizations want to establish membership or leadership requirements, um, which say, in essence, that as a leader or a member of this group, you're actually going to believe in the faith doctrines of the group. It doesn't sound like a particularly novel idea, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the, these are the claims that are made against faith-based groups to try to cancel them out on campus. Okay, Ken Tashi, Campus Reform Education Fellow. Ken, I'm sure Campus Reform will stay on top of these and others, and thank you for setting us straight today. We appreciate it. Gary, thank you very much for your time. Also in this week's episode of The Global Lane, scientists secretly seeding clouds in San Francisco, hoping to reduce global warming and some America's biggest cities doing a big turnaround on easy crime and drug laws. You can see it all on the Global Lane this evening on the CBN News Channel. It begins at 8 Eastern. You can also see it on the CBN News app or you can watch on YouTube. We'll be right back with an encouraging word for your day ahead. Stay with us. Download the CBN News app 24-7 News from a Christian perspective at home or on the road. One place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Set daily prayer goals and pray for news stories. Read the most important news and watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Go to CBNNewsApp.com to get the app today. Time now for your Thursday Thankful, and today I offer this prayer of gratitude. God, I thank you for opening our eyes to the cause of trouble, the categories of trouble, and the cure for trouble. Truth is, you are the answer to all the trouble that concerns your people. To that prayer, may we all say amen and amen. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. You can always find more news on our programs on the CBN News Channel or online. That address is cbnnews.com. Take a moment. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen today. You can email us, newswatch at cbn.com. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Make it a thankful Thursday. We'll see you tomorrow.